Good afternoon. Today I have the lovely Philippa with me. Hiya, Philippa. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, Donna. Thank you very much for having me along to chat today. I'm Philippa East. I'm a psychological suspense author with HQ HarperCollins, and my books are uh, Little White Lies, um, Safe and Sound. This is a proof copy, uh, actually, because I... Um, I ran out, sold out of my other ones. Um, and my latest book, which is I'll Never Tell. Um, did you always know that you wanted to write? Um, no, is the short answer. Um, I think when I was growing up, ever since I was a kid, I absolutely loved books and reading and stories. But when I was growing up, I didn't have any perception that being a writer was a job that you could do. I mean, obviously I knew that there was authors out there that wrote these books that I was reading, but I had no sense of um, like that that was a career path I could could follow. I didn't know any authors. There was no one like that in my family. Um, so I, I ended up studying psychology and qualified as a clinical psychologist. And that was my day job until, um, well, I mean, I still practice now, but part time. Um, but yeah, I didn't really think about writing until I was in my sort of thirties, and I took it up initially just for fun, just as a hobby, uh, and then found I just really, really loved it and started to take it more seriously. And eventually, yeah, got a publishing deal. Yeah, and sort of in retrospect, it makes sense because I can't imagine like books have always been a thing and all the way through even as a psychologist I was always interested in stories writing this kind of stuff but yeah short answer is no and then what made you just uh, take the decision to do it was it a gradual build-up of like writing for fun and then you thought mm, maybe I've got a story and yeah pretty much so as I was saying I I started off just it was kind of one of a number of sort of like hobbies that I tried I just dabbled in various things you know throughout my life and most of them I was shit at <laughs> um but yeah I started writing very much for fun I wrote um a manuscript of a novel which is terrible and not my kind of not the genre that I write in now it's kind of like a weird rom-com thing it was very strange <laughs> um but uh, but sort of in the course of writing that I joined a few writers groups and writers communities online and that kind of thing which was lovely and just sort of got into the whole um sort of space of writers and writing um and then I sort of I sort of set that novel to one side I never even tried to get it published like it was yeah it wasn't that was never the aim and I kind of knew that it wasn't going to um, but I started writing short stories and that was a really good way for me to um, practice my craft and also just practice and discover what sort of things I like to write about and what sort of themes interested me, that kind of thing. Um, and it was, I suppose it was when I started getting some of the short stories published that it made me think that perhaps, perhaps I was basically good enough to be a published, published author. Um, so that I suppose that it was a gradual thing in some ways yeah and then I think that probably getting short stories published was that was the kind of tipping point for me to to think that I first of all that I wanted to keep doing this and 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 be more ambitious with it I guess and then your first book what came first the characters or the story oh uh oh that's a funny one um probably the story in a way although I think they kind of arrived pretty much at the same time. I from from the very beginning of writing the book, the cast of characters didn't really change. So that the the premise of the story, um, and this is for as I mentioned, da, 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 little white lies. Um, the premise of the story is about a family whose young daughter has been missing for about seven years, but the story begins with Abigail being found. So, because I've been reading, oh, in the wake of Gone Girl being published in, what was that, 2013, something like that, it's ages ago now, there were loads and loads and loads and loads of books about people going missing, which, and it's still a really core trope of the thriller, psychological thriller genre. But I was thinking like, 
what about the whole story that might have happen after a missing child is found and and really kind of going into the story of how that actually might be traumatic for the family as well but just in a different way um and i think from the beginning i i i mean maybe because i was thinking a bit about madeline mccann so from the beginning abigail had two small brothers i think madeline mccann maybe has a younger brother and sister who are twins I'm not quite sure yeah but, something like that isn't it yeah. yeah so so in my mind Abigail had two younger siblings and she had you know she had her parents although in my book the dad is a, a stepdad but then at the same time um I was really clear that the other character and one of the main point of view characters for Little White Lies is um um Jess who is Abigail's cousin same age cousin um and then Jess has her parents. And I really, I, I really want, the, the, st the story really started as the story through Jess's eyes of her cousin coming home. And they've been like really, really close as ch children. And then Abigail basically returns as a stranger. Um, so story and character kind of came together. And I think for me, generally, probably story comes first, but normally I, I very quickly have an idea of the characters who are going to tell that story as well once I have the story itself yeah interesting question I haven't really yeah it's an interesting one made me think <laughs> <laughs> good this is what I like there'll be more of those hopefully <laughs> <laughs> um how do you choose character names oh that's a hard one I just whatever comes to mind and I guess I try to pick a name that I feel fits with the character. Like if I had a very plain character who was supposed to come across as quite plain, I wouldn't call her Petunia or something like that. And vice versa, if I had a character who was supposed to be quite exotic, I would probably try to give her a more exotic name. Um, but but yeah, it's a funny one. Like I, I've called characters name, like I didn't even realize, but in my, in my second book, safe and sound um the um the woman who dies or is found dead in her bed set is called sarah jones and when i was working on the book i'd written a whole load of it and i sent it to my agent and then like three minutes after emailing it to my agent i was like my agent is called sarah <laughs> like, <laughs> it hadn't crossed my mind at all that i'd named one of my main characters sarah <laughs> um and like I've got characters who've got the same name as family members as well but they don't they don't they're not the same people at all so yeah and my, and my character names often change actually I do often rename my characters in the course of the book um and I think when I when I settle on a name that's when I feel like I know the character sometimes their name will shift around while I'm not clear on the character or I feel like I don't really know them yeah, and I, I, I used to ask the question when I very first started doing this, and then I stopped asking, and then um, I saw other people, and actually the answers generally are so varied that as I'm always shocked how people choose their character names. So yeah, well, more recently I did run a competition where I got people to enter a lottery um, to have their name in one of my next books. Uh, so that was that was that was nice. And actually, the name that I picked was um, a guy called Peter Bird which is a great name. That's a great character name. So I was like, oh, I was a well chuff, you know? So yeah, Peter Bird, you will be showing up in a future book before too long. <laughs> well, I have um, the, the I have a, a, a name saved on my phone because I'm like, that is just such a cool name. That's asking for a book to be written about them because it's such a cool um, name. But, what is um, that? Or are you not allowed to show? Huh? Jack Dash. Jack Dash, yeah, perfect. <laughs> How cool is it? That's like asking for like a PI or something to be, you know, yeah. it's such yeah. a cool name. Yeah, hi, Dash, Jack Dash. <laughs> so I just, I can't remember where I saw it. I'm like, I'm, I'm writing that down now. So yeah, I don't yeah, forget. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I wrote a book, I've written a book, and um, uh, I wanted to kill someone that I can't stand. But I kept his real name because when I was writing it, it helped. But I've had to apologise to other people that I really like with the same name. Oh, like, yeah. When you read it, just know. Yeah. Like, I'm really sorry, but it's not you. Yeah, I've had to do that. I had to call my dad up and I was like, Dad, I didn't realise there was a character in my book called Brian, which is my dad's name. 
And I'm like, he's basically like a narcissistic psychopath, but it's not you. <laughs> I was like, honestly, like my dad could not be further from that characterization. <laughs> yeah I mean you know my character is Peter he really suffers so I'm like I'm and one of the guys that wants to read it's a cozy crime writer so obviously it's not he doesn't generally read the sort of grittier Hmm. stuff so but he wants to read it because I've written it so I'm like yeah I'm really sorry (laughs) (laughs) very sorry (laughs) bless him it's quite funny (laughs) Um, I've completely forgotten. Oh, uh, do you hide any um, secret jokes, messages, or Easter eggs in your books? Um, not usually. Not usually. And um, but in so I didn't think of doing it before. But in I'll Never Tell, I got my spouse. I said I said to them, um, "Give me a word, and I'll put it in the book, and that'll be like then you know you'll know that I've put a little yeah like an Easter egg in there for you." And the word that they gave me was ombre. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so, so in one of the scenes in I'll Never Tell, I don't know which one it is. Uh, I'm trying to think. So anyway, so Julia, who's the kind of <laughs> mum and wife, she and her husband, Paul, go out for dinner. At, um, um, like go out for a posh dinner at one point and Julia comes down wearing a dress that has an ombre. Um color pa- palette on it so I need to I need to get Elliot to give me another word for my next the next book that will be coming out in February which is in the editing so I'll, I'll find another word to put them in yeah <laughs> it's quite <laughs> fun because you can fit like most words you can fit in somewhere right someone someone don't give me a word like you know I don't know oh uh, you know supercalifragilistic or something like that I'm like oh come on man <laughs> yeah yeah as long as it's reasonable <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, talking about editing, when you um, self-edit or when you send it off, what do you get shouted at for overusing? Oh, interesting. Um, I can have a bit of a habit of like re- repeating phrases for emphasis, but I do it too much and it becomes a bit melodramatic. Um, so like <laughs> I'll, it, I'll have a character who's like um, saying something like, I can't do it. I can't. I just can't. I can't, okay? And my editor will be like, probably like two of the four is fine. And I'm like, yeah, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So that's probably one. Apparently I use the word though quite a lot, um, as in like, it was difficult though, (laughs) whatever. So I don't know, but that's what editors are for, isn't it? Um, Like, because I don't notice, I don't notice that I'm doing it and I could waste a lot of time trying to second guess and go through and comb out all this stuff but at the end of the day you kind of need that other pair of eyes on it to be like actually you know this this is yeah that that is working in those sentences and those phrases but actually that's not and that's I don't really see that as something I can I can really judge um but yeah sometimes sometimes my phraseology gets a bit melodramatic <laughs> I think it's the basic <laughs> one <laughs> that's brilliant I think that's the best answer to that question I've ever had as well that's great <laughs> Now when you're reading my books, you have to look for all those. All those yeah. <laughs> if I'm going to put it at any page, we'll be able to find one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, us women can be a bit melodramatic anyway, so... Nothing wrong with a bit of melodrama, I think, you know? <laughs> you know, if it gets our point across, then who cares? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes you've got to repeat yourself. <laughs> exactly. If people listen the first time, we wouldn't have to say it, but they do. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not our fault. <laughs> um if you were to take out a character from any of your books for a meal who would you choose and what would you ask them oh man um oh god a lot of my characters aren't hugely likable so I'm not sure that I'd really want to not sure I'd want to sit down over dinner with them but they're all quite they've all got quite a few flaws let me have a think um Oh, that is really hard. That's terrible. I don't think I want to have dinner with any of my characters. Um, maybe, uh, let me have a think. Probably, it would probably be a kind of side character whose take on the whole story I would be interested. Oh, actually, I know. I think I know who who I'd like to, so I'd like to pick her brains on the whole thing. So, 
I'll try not to get give any spoilers away, but for anyone who has read I'll Never Tell, I would like that like I would like to sit down with the wife of Francis, who's one of the characters in I'll Never Tell. Um to get yeah like because mm, I feel like there's a lot more we need to know about this Francis character that probably we never quite find out in the book and uh, yeah I think I'd probably so not like for a nice fun meal but more like what the fuck do you make of all that? <laughs> <laughs> so Francis's <laughs> wife yeah <laughs> Um, and if a film were to be made of any of your books, what character would you um, play? Which character would I play? Oh, my God. I would probably play um, Lillian from Little White Lies, who is... Uh, so she's the older sister. She's the aunt of Abigail, the missing girl. And she, so she's the older sister of Abigail's mum. And she's really quite controlling and bossy. And she's kind of, she's a, quite a big influence on the whole family dynamic. She's Jess's mom as well, Jess the cousin. Um, and I think, I think I've got quite a few personality traits that are quite similar to Lillian's. I'm quite, I can be quite controlling. I always think I'm right. Um, so I would, I would probably be Lillian and Lillian, yeah, kind of, kind of has to do a bit of reckoning with herself in the course of the book so I think I think I'm I probably write unlikable characters because I think I probably just put my all my own character flaws into them <laughs> and I hope that people will be like oh no we like them really and then everyone just in the reviews like yeah not very likable these characters and I'm like well oh, I like them because they're a bit like me <laughs> damn it <laughs> those characters are no fun anyway are they horrible yeah. characters are so much more fun yeah exactly <laughs> thank you <laughs> um do you have absolutely um any no-nos that you'd never write do you mean in terms of like genre or storylines or what either kind of... either or both <laughs> uh oh interesting I think I would be really really rubbish at writing either either romance or uplet because I would like I would probably get maximum 75% of the way through and I'd be like I have to kill someone like it's too like <laughs> this is, like, it's not dark enough I think I think I'm so drawn to writing about things that are quite dark or disturbing or or difficult that I I just wouldn't be able to uh, sort of sustain the kind of optimism <laughs> and and sort of like positivity um I mean not not to say that those books obviously don't have their own kind of tensions and conflicts and everything but yeah I mean I I, I think it's a great skill to be able to write to write that kind of fiction that really kind of is so enjoyable to read and so kind of affirming to read but unfortunately it's not <laughs> yeah it's not what I can what I can do I'm too mean and want to make my characters suffer too much <laughs> I've had so many uh, crime writers say that. It's so funny. <laughs> Trying yeah. to write it, they just want to kill yeah. someone. <laughs> but it's good because there's plenty of other authors out there who are nailing that genre. So it doesn't need me. It doesn't need me at all. Yeah, there's loads of them. They're fine. And yeah. apparently crime writers are nicer because they kill people in fiction. I've heard okay. this. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've got we've got an outlet for all that, you know, the rage that all of us carry with us and all of that. Whereas if you had to kind of be... Yeah, if you had to be like positive all the time, I think you'd, it would all fester around somewhere, wouldn't it? You know? Yeah. Perhaps you'd have to sort of write a short story that you never publish as a romance yeah. author to kill people and then yeah, get it just, out that way. <laughs> yeah, I just keep writing all these vignettes of like horrific murders and things. Yeah. <laughs> never, make sure they never get see the light of day anywhere. <laughs> perhaps, yeah, perhaps that's not healthy. I don't know. <laughs> no, I think so. I, I think the more that we are in touch with those kind of difficult feelings, the healthier we are. Absolutely. I think so. Yeah. I think it's better out than in would be my take. <laughs> um, when you uh, progress from short stories to a full novel, what did you find more difficult than you expected? Everything. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, um, I think it was difficult with plot and structure because in a short story, typically 
you've got such a such a focused kind of slice that you're looking at correctly you can't you can't have a complex multi-layered plot in a short story it's not really what it's designed for um so I thought I thought I knew quite a lot about structure but but really I only knew enough to to figure out the structure of a chapter because <laughs> a short story and a chapter are probably typically probably roughly the same length um and I really didn't have a a sense of how to you know how to structure the arc over an entire entire novel and also I think that um just the sheer amount of rewriting and editing because again a short story often goes through lots of rewriting and editing but you can do it in such a short time scale you know to edit to, to edit an entire short story would probably take you a day or, or a week whereas obviously editing an entire novel can take a you know half a year a year and I think I think it was quite easy for me to with my debut to get ground down when there was um so many rounds of edits that it really you know it made me just be like I don't know how to do this and it's never going to be good enough so I think that was I think that was the hardest thing but the flip side is I think I actually because I think I'm I'm a natural kind of marathon runner rather than a sprinter so actually I quite like working on novels that do take a year or two overall to complete that actually suits me quite well um so so having that kind of bigger project to really to really kind of immerse myself in and, and have that space to work. But yeah, it was a bit of a shock to the system at the start. I thought I knew more than I did, basically. It's like, I've written, you know, so many short stories and I've had all of these ones published. I'm nailing it. And it was like, you don't know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could well imagine. Oh, yeah. Um, have you made lots of author friends and reader friends since you became a writer? Um, yeah, both. I mean, I, I love it when readers get in touch and, you know, I, I, I always feel like really tickled and touched if a reader like bothers to get and they send a message. And I'm like, oh my God, I think they can't touch me. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that. You know, I, I always, I, I reply to every message that people send me and, you know, I, I, I absolutely love it. And I, you know, I, I, I think I'm I'm mindful not to try not to impose myself on on readers because I think, you know, it, they they it's up to them to take my books if they want, when they want, and make up their own minds about it. And they don't they don't need me butting in and being like, What do you think? What do you think? or anything like that. You know, I wait for them to come to me. That's that doesn't that feels right. But um but yeah, I love it when 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 readers do. Um and with writers, yeah, absolutely. So when um, in the run up, well, you know, my my debut came out in 2020 and obviously that's when we went into lockdown. <laughs> so we actually, the, the silver lining of that was um, a whole load of us who were um, having our debuts come out in 2020. We formed um, our own, it started off as a, as a sort of Facebook group and, and we've since kind of had lots and lots of different ways that we support each other through then so through that since then so um that has been absolutely invaluable so that's my core kind of writer network um but yeah absolutely no obviously there's a great sort of writers community authors community on places like twitter that i i'm super involved with and it's writers are lovely people and really generous really supportive and i mean maybe some people like to be more isolated or private with their writing maybe that suits some people in which case that's fine but I really I really love having other people to kind of cry to and I feel like they're just my <laughs> tribe I feel really at home I feel like these are my people you know they're all introverts with cats and I'm like <laughs> so, yeah and and again readers readers bloggers people like you are just lovely and amazing and it's great <laughs> I must admit, I quite like Twitter because generally uh, the authors just take the piss out of each other all day, which is really <laughs> more so than Facebook, I find. Yeah, especially like yeah. Abby Mukherjee and uh, Vaz Khan and Imran and stuff. They're all just <laughs> constantly and it's just so funny. Yeah. So, yeah, I find that more on Twitter, I think, but it's great. Yeah, I think, I think Twitter's sort of in general slightly less, slightly more, what's the word, um, I was going to say dis disrespectful, that's not quite what I'm, irreverent, that's the word I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite, 
quite a bit of sarky dry humor which which is right up my alley too yeah yeah, it's, I mean, you know, if I'm reading it at work and I start laughing, I can't really explain why I'm laughing. It's like you just, <laughs> you don't get it, but it's just really funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But they're off, they're off again. The children are playing again. They're taking yeah. the <laughs> playground spat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dear, bless them. Um, if you're able to spend a day with any author, dead or alive, who would you like to spend a day with? Oh my god, that's so difficult. Um, uh, there's, I mean, there's so many writers that I, I really, really admire. But I'm trying to also pick someone that I wouldn't be totally intimidated by because otherwise, it'd be like, oh my god, this is too much. Um, oh gosh, that's such a good. And then I'm thinking, like, you know, there's there's authors that I kind of already know that I think are great, but who would I? Oh god, I feel like I would have to come. Uh, no, actually, I think. The author that I would like to sit down with would probably be an author called um, Megan Abbott, who is a American author. Don't really know her. I see her around on Twitter, but she's not like, I don't think she would know who I was. <laughs> but she writes, she writes, she writes in a, a kind of qu across quite a wide genre. She wrote kind of, um, what's the word, like sort of retro, cr retro noir crime books initially. And, and more recently, she, she writes you know she's written the kind of psychological thrillers but she's quite literary as well and I just really love her books and she comes across as you know a really interesting person and I yeah I think I'd just be interested to know her take on life and the world and writing and yeah so Megan Abbott if you happen to stumble across this video <laughs> you might see a coffee or a zoom chat then let me know <laughs> Have you messaged her? I had this the other day. I asked an American author who she'd like to spend a day with and she read this book and said she loved it. I'm like, have you messaged her to tell her, you know, you said you love when readers contact you. So have you messaged her? And she said, well, no, actually I haven't, but I will. So have you messaged her and told her? <laughs> I've definitely messaged Megan like on Twitter to be like, I've just read your book and loved it. And yeah, I think mostly I sort of, she either like just likes my tweet or is just like, thanks. No, okay. I'll leave it at that then. Yeah. <laughs> but, I'll, but that's not going to stop me. Like every time I read one of her books, I will totally tag her and be like, yeah. "I love you." Because yeah, absolutely. Why not? Like I, like I say, like I love it when people, you know, let me know that they've enjoyed something. So yeah, and if they don't want to respond to me, that's fine. It's totally fine. Like I, just, I don't have a problem with that. So yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, always tag. When they do it, even at like in a tweet, you're like, ah. Because I read um, <laughs> Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus, oh, yeah, uh, which obviously yeah. was insane. And she yeah. liked one of my tweet or, tweets or said thank you. And I was like, ah. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. yeah like I, I, I mean, I know, I know there's probably some authors who just, they just don't have the time or the capacity or maybe they find social media difficult. And I totally understand that. But yeah, I like, I'm, I'm always, I'm always gushing back on social media. <laughs> yeah. Because it's lovely. I love it. Yeah. It's, you know, it means a lot. Yeah, I know it, <laughs> and we still get squealy because obviously, you know, for readers, we always say that authors are our rock stars. So you know, when we get a like, <laughs> stay made, weak made, that's all it takes. We're very easily pleased. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I, but I also think that mostly authors are actually really down to earth. You know, even like massive best-selling authors, they're. I don't know. Maybe it's because we don't. You know, our our art isn't public. It's not like we're on a stage, like a pop star or an actor or something. We are, in many ways, just invisible, aren't we? Unless we really kind of, you know, put ourselves out there. So I think, I think most authors don't really th don't think of themselves as famous or celebrities. Just like, oh, I'm just like sitting in my pajamas, scratching my ass, like <laughs> typing some words. Like, if you like that, that's cool. <laughs> yeah and yet you know where bloggers go to Harrogate and stuff you know oh my god it really yeah it's, it is just like seeing actors I guess for us but, <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah they're just like yeah we're just gonna get a drink <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. and it's probably like because I mean I suppose I have that yeah I have that weird feeling that if I meet an author like a mega author I would be like starstruck but I don't like but then I'm like well I you know I'm I'm a published author. There's lots of people who've read my books. 
but I don't think that I'm anything special. Like I just, I'm just like a normal person who like has to clean the toilet and things. So, but, but so maybe that's the thing. Probably all famous people feel like that, don't they? Like you don't feel famous. You're just like I'm just a human being, and like. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've met Richard Osman and and I saw him speak at Capital Crime last year and, you know, he was saying about how hard it was to write his book and stuff. You know, he's quite maligned and stuff, but, you know, he put the hard work in and he done it, the same as everyone else, just because he's done a few deli shows. You know, yeah. he's still... And, yeah, he was he's just a guy. Yeah, very yeah, tall, so, yeah. but, but yes. other than that, yeah, very, very, just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, less down to earth because of his height, but otherwise down to earth. <laughs> yeah. Well, thankfully, he was sitting down. I had a picture of him and he was sitting oh, down. Right, yeah. Because I'm quite short anyway, so I'm not even sure I'd have reached his shoulder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that would have just been embarrassing. But um, <laughs> yeah. Although I haven't had a picture of Jack Jordan because he's also very tall. And yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I've seen him on social media and assumed he was. Because he's quite slim and everything, you know, I thought he'll, he'll look, he'll be sort of average height. And then I met him at actually the book launch for Law Van Rensburg's um, Nobody But Us. And I was like, oh, wow, Jack, you're tall. <laughs> and then there's all these other people. I was like, wow, you're short. Because <laughs> like, like, everyone was just kind of average height on Zoom, right? You know, that Yeah, is. exactly. Yeah, you just, you know, chest up and that's it. You, were, you yeah. wouldn't have a clue. Yeah. He's <laughs> ridiculously tall. Just like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He's very sweet though. He's such a sweetheart, bless him. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you're able to travel to any time period, either forwards or backwards, where would you like to go? Do you know what? I've always said um I would go back to the time of um when Jesus Christ was apparently alive. I'm not I'm not religious myself, but I just think, you know. It's one of the biggest questions that we have, don't we? And like, who would like did? I mean, I my my view is that there probably was an actual person that we know as Jesus, right? Um, but but actually, I would just be fascinated to see the reality of what what actually happened at that time, you know, and just just go back there as a as a historical exercise. Um, that's probably in some ways a bit boring, but like, yeah, I think that's, I think that's what. I, I would I that's probably one of the biggest questions that I would have I just like to know because it's going back to what you were saying about like celebrities right I mean Jesus is like the biggest celebrity we've ever known in the world or one of and how much of what we read about him or think we know about him how would that actually match who he actually was and how he lived his life and how he interacted with people um yeah I mean obviously there's the whole you know religious perspective on on who he was but even taking, you know, even setting that aside, you know, even the kind of secular views of of who he was, we would know so little. And I just would be really interested to, I mean, he might have been a complete dickhead, who knows? Like, he might have been a right ass, and everyone, <laughs> everyone was like, oh my God, that Jesus guy is so up himself. Or, I don't know, it would be so interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. It really yeah. would, actually, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my answer to that question. A bit random, but there you go. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, funny question. Who was your first celebrity crush? Oh my gosh. Well, I don't think I really had celebrity crushes, mainly because um, I grew up without a TV until I was about 11. So I didn't really have, I didn't really see anyone. Um, it was probably off. <laughs> oh, celebrity crush. <sighs> oh, I know. Actually, I do remember. I do remember now. Christian Slater in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. <laughs> and my, my best friend fancied Kevin Costner. I mean, I'm not saying Kevin Costner is not sexy, but I was like, he's like 53 or so. I mean, we were like, like eight. <laughs> I was like, whereas Christian, well, I mean, I suppose Christian Slater was probably like 23 or something in that film. So still a bit out of my age range. But anyway, <laughs> Christian Slater, that floppy hair that he had. And yeah, so it, was, it would have been Christian Slater. <laughs> I saw that recently funnily enough I didn't realize that um Alan Rickman was in it either which was a yeah. surprise yeah. yeah 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 great film I mean it stands up stands the test of time doesn't it you know yeah <laughs> and Brian Adams song that came off the back of it that's number one forever yeah and who else is in it um oh god what's his name 
Morgan Freeman, is that who I mean? Yeah, I mean, yes, he, yes, he was. Yeah, yeah. I know. I'm, I was really shocked when I was watching it. I'm like, wow, I didn't I had no idea because he is, you know, but I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hello. <laughs> um, if I was to ask those closest to you what your most annoying habits are, what would they say? Oh, um, well, I've got plenty of those. Um, annoying habits. <laughs> Um, my spouse would say I'm always trying to plan everything too much. Um, we both come from quite different backgrounds. My my family are super planners. So like, I'll be getting a phone call probably within the next two weeks with my mom being like, what should we do for Christmas this year? And I'll be like, oh, it's <laughs> April. Whereas my spouse's family, that discussion would happen like on like the 20th of December. So I do, try, I, I have like cut back my like excessive, like advanced planning. Um, and my spouse is like, tries to be a bit more sort of forward thinking, We're still not quite meeting in the middle. But, so yeah, like a bit like unnecessary planning would probably be one. Um, I'm sure I've got loads more, but I probably don't even realize. <laughs> Going well, to bed in the afternoon to read a book, that, that's probably, but I'm like, <laughs> what's wrong with being in bed? It's the comfiest place to read. Like, I don't see yeah. the problem. You can get in bed if you want, I'm not stopping you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this is what adulthood is. You could do what you want now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm not hurting anybody. <laughs> um, top read so far this year? Oh no, it's one of the questions that I hate. Partly because I read so many books I can never remember. <laughs> yeah. um, what did I read this year? Oh, I've read I've read loads of good books. Um the one I'm gonna mention, I I think it, it would have been this year, I think it was, or close enough to, is End of Story by um Louise Beach. I think she's written it under the name Louise Swanson. Is that right? I don't know if got yeah, I know what you mean. I'm not sure if that is under Louise Beach actually. Yeah, yeah, I think it might be Louise Swanson or Louise something else, but it's an absolute cracker. It's incredibly innovative and it's it's part part psychological thriller, part kind of dystopian novel, and part um like really interesting reflection on kind of loss and the meaning of the meaning of stories in our lives generally. It's an abs like I think that's I've not read all of Louise's books, but I've read quite a few of them. And I think it's an, like an absolute cracker from her. And I think also I would say that it's a real, a real fresh innovation in the kind of psychological thriller genre. Like I really feel like it's just taken it up another level or really kind of pushed the boundaries. So absolutely, I, I really, really enjoyed that book and would highly recommend it to anyone else. Yeah, there's been other lots of other great reads I've had this year, but off the top of my head, that's the one I can think of. Yeah, um, it's on my TBR. <laughs> yeah. Is it 18 minutes or 18 seconds, 18 minutes? Can't remember. A very oh, which one? Oh. oh, right, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's got another one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, um, I went to Newcastle Noir and she was there and she'd done a trauma workshop um, and she spoke about it. Um, and it sounds like it'll be a tough read, but also really, because it's that, about... Is it about her um, mom? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's I want to read more, it. But... Think, it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, amazing that she's felt ready to to write that. And yeah. Yeah. She hmm. said, because um, I think there's text exchanges with her siblings and they're, I think there are funny bits in it because they're quite that sort of family. So, yeah, I don't think it would be too hot. <laughs> yeah. Heartbreaking, but yeah, bless her. Mm, yeah, I need to look out for that one as well, for sure. Yeah, I think I've seen it sort of being mentioned, so I guess it's out relatively soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, What's coming next for you? Well, um, my <laughs> next book... Um, which I am very excited about, is coming out in February. Um, and I know that in one way that feels like quite a long way away, but they it always comes around really quickly. Like, and I, I think like we'll be starting 
you know, we'll be starting kind of doing things like the cover reveals and the kind of initial promotions that coming up for fleet order, all of that kind of stuff that will be kicking off fairly soon, which is always like the such a lovely part of the whole process because the like the kind of hardest work on my end is done. Um, so that book's called, well, the working title at the moment, I think is, I'm pretty sure it's the title that we're going with is um, A Guilty Secret. And the book is, I haven't got a perfect pitch for it yet, but it's about a remote Scottish boarding school, a group of teenagers getting up to no good in the woods behind the school, um, the bizarre suicide of a beloved psychotherapist, and two ex-spouses who are thrown back together to investigate the connection between all of these creepy goings on. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Watch this space. It's probably technically available to pre-order on Amazon now. I think it is, but it doesn't have a cover and all that yet. So, but if you're really keen, then click <laughs> away, buy away, be my guest, go for it. <laughs> but that'll be out in February. Yeah. Yeah, that does sound miles away. So. <laughs> <laughs> Like in my head, it's still February. You know, it's yeah. it's nearly May. Yeah. How has this happened again? <laughs> slipped and ended up in May. Yeah, that's it's like it's like you lose your footing in February and they end up in May. It's like what happened there? <laughs> yeah, you just blinked and Easter's gone and yeah. yeah, yeah, very bizarre. I know. And then it'll be August before we know it, and then Christmas. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, I don't think I have any more questions for you, Anis. Do you think there's anything major or anything else that you want to tell us? No, it's been brilliant. It's been a lovely chat. Very enjoyable and entertaining. So thank you, Donna. It's been a real pleasure. Um, do you want to show off your books again and remind everyone where they can get them from and where they can find out more about you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's my debut, Little White Light which is the one about the missing child who returns um there is safe and sound um which is about a young charismatic pretty sociable woman called sarah jones who is found dead in her bedsit um and nobody realized she died for 10 whole months and the housing manager who investigates how the fuck did that happen and then we have I'll Never Tell, which is also out now. And this is about a um, prodigious violinist, Chrissy, who is 16 years old, who vanishes after a very, very public performance at the Barbican Theatre um, Young Musician of the Year competition, completely exploding all the secrets in her seemingly perfect family. And you can get these books wherever you buy books. So obviously, um, I always recommend bookshop.org, which is a great online store that supports independent bookshops. If you don't have an independent bookshop of your own nearby, or if you do, go and you know, get the books through them. Um, obviously, all the other usual places, Waterstones and Amazon. Um, if you go onto my Amazon page, then I have a yellow follow button which obviously all authors do so I always encourage people to click that because then you'll get updates about my new releases and so on so you don't miss anything and in terms of connecting with me like we were talking about before if you want to say hi you know recommend books to me tell me about your own writing whatever the main place I hang out is Twitter and I'm on there as Philippa with one L underscore East um yeah Philippa underscore East is my handle so see you there Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Donna. Thank you.